Hello everyone, welcome to this is Ali Nessa, and I'm here in the beautiful city of Heidelberg in Germany. And I was here for a little business. Of course, the Oktoberfest is going on at the same time, so it can't be without some pleasure. Uh, but uh, I figured since I'm here in the historical city, let's go back and take a look at some of the history of what we've been teaching here at Vivo Dendo, which is the endosequence system. And let's take a look at using the endosequence file in a molar tube. So, let's go to it. Okay, folks, so let's have a little bit of a blast from the past and talk about the endosequence system. The endosequence system is a, uh, a very robust system that's been around now for over 10 years. It was originally developed by Dr. Koch and Brave, and it's a fairly simple system. I've talked about this before, but just to re refresh your memory, uh, the idea is to get a, a constant taper preparation with a master file, which will then be matched with a, uh, with a matching paper point and a bioceramic coated gutta percha cone, and you also have a matching post as well as uh, some uh, core material to match that post as well. So uh, it's a very versatile system and what's the beauty of it uh, compared to the ESX for example is that you have all kinds of sizes. You have sizes 15 through 50 in the 06 taper which is the blue uh, stopper and sizes 15 through 80 in the 04 stoppers. Now I only use the 04 tapers in the endo sequence for reasons that I've mentioned before because of the fact that it uh, is for far more minimally invasive coronally it doesn't remove um, too much coronal uh, tooth structure unnecessarily as a result of the excessive taper and because of the use of hydraulic condensation which is bonded uh, uh, obturation using biceramic sealer. Now, all of these files on the endosequence side were originally kind of packaged in these procedural packs of four files per package, and it was sizes small, medium, and large, and extra large. And the way you would uh, figure out what size you need to use for each um, package was through this file called the expediter. Now, this is the original expediter that was going with the endosequence file, and based on how uh, it engaged in the canal at the beginning of the instrumentation, uh, whether it went in or it didn't go in at all or just went in a little bit or it went in just a, uh, up to half the file or all the way in you would choose whether you have a small medium or large file uh, canal and you would use the small medium or large package of files you would open that up and uh, you would use the basic endo sequence technique which was the following which you would just get at the beginning a size 10 hand file down then the expediter file and then triage the case into a, a small medium or large package of files and then you would use these files in a crown down fashion. So let's say most of the cases would end up being a medium pack of files, so you had sizes 40 through 25, and you would use it with size 40 first, then 35 next, and then 30 next, and then 25. And uh, you would use this, in uh, the technique that I had described was in a cycle, so that you would get down to the 25 and go back to a 40. And then you would do these multiple cycles until the first file reached the apex. Once the first file reached the apex, then you would do one last cycle, and the next file that reached the apex would be your, uh, your master apical file. So a fairly easy and straightforward uh, technique. And this was the uh, tip uh, that I had prepared for this particular use of files which was in the cycle. So for example, on a medium procedural pack, you would go from a size 40 to a 35 to a 30, 20, 25, and then restart again from a size 40, which would, you know, at the 25, you have completed the cycle. The goal was that you would use these with a specific motion uh, in this direction, and then go back to a size 40. And the motion that you were using with was the rhythm motion, which was originally described by Dr. Scotch and Brave, which was these uh, multiple strokes of three strokes strokes then then you would remove the file and wipe it so the idea was one stroke to engagement, two strokes to engagement, three strokes to engagement, and then you would remove the file and wipe it. And so that's the, one of the main differentiations between the endo sequence and the ESX, because the ESX uh, f uh, instrumentation system is used with a single stroke, uh, and then it's cleaned out. But the ESX, you could do three strokes and then clean it out. And the reason why is because the, uh, the, the cutting action is shared among four the different files plus the expediter, whereas in the, in the, whereas in the ESX, it's only a one or two files that are doing the job. Therefore, it's very important not to over torque the files. Uh, here, because you, you're cutting across uh, a number of files, uh, each file can get a little bit more torqued. Still not too much pushing, but uh, it can get a little bit more torqued. So why don't we go ahead and uh, do a little demo using uh, the endo sequence file 
in the uh, molar tooth. So basically what ends up doing we're going to use a uh, the basic technique here in this tooth number 30 and as you can see it's a fairly straightforward uh, tooth number 30 here that has irreversible pulpitis as usual we always do an estimated length using our digital radiography here as a method of determining what kind of a uh, length are we going to expect from the tooth so that we can have an idea before we even enter uh, the pulp so as usual, in cases where a crown is indicated afterwards, we use a flat diamond to flatten the cusps and then use our saber cut burr uh, from the endo sequence um, um, access kit followed by a, either the H269GK or a diamond burr to make everything flow together. And then once we have that, then we use our ultrasonic with lots of water to, um, uh, to remove the debris and also more, furthermore blend everything in together and remove the dental triangles. Now it's very critical to use lots of water in these cases and specifically in this case because you have uh, an amalgam here and have an amalgam filling and the, the, the particles that uh, are left around as a result of cutting into an amalgam filling for your uh, access preparation can end up getting lodged into the uh, canals or down the canal even worse and that's very important to use ultrasonic and water at the beginning and make sure before you put any files uh, into the uh, canal to make sure that all debris has been removed. Now this is even more critical in necrotic cases. This was an irreversible pulpitis so you still had a pulp but whenever you have a necrotic tooth with a large amalgam restoration it's critical that you make sure that you are removing uh, all of the amalgam. In fact make your access preparation a little bit larger so that you don't have to later on go back and remove more amalgam. And if you can remove all the amalgam, it's even better so that you don't end up getting um, any particles down the canal. All right, so uh, let's get back to the case here. And now we're using a number 10 stiff control flex uh, hand file to uh, just get what we call the available length. Now, what is the available length? Available length is right at the beginning when you open into a canal, you use a stiff hand file, a size 10 or a size 15, to go down without too much heavy instrumentation to find out what is the available length. Now, you have an estimated length in mind, you use an available length to find out what is open. And obviously your available length should be shorter than your uh, estimated length. And uh, at that point you have uh, you have a certain amount of available patent length that, that you know and you will mark that on your files uh, and keep that in mind in terms of how deep you go. You don't want your rotary files to go deeper than your available length with a hand file because the, again uh, I've mentioned this before but a hand file's job is to uh, go down and scout and find space, available space, and then a rotary file's job is to enlarge that space. So you always want to scout with a stiff stainless steel hand file and then follow that up to that length and shorter than that and certainly not longer than that with a rotary file. So you get your available length and now you start to do your endo sequence um, cycle and here uh, you use first the uh, expedito file to find out what kind of a canal you're dealing with here and here it ends up that you're having a medium uh, uh, type of a canal in terms of its uh, diameter so you open a medium package of files. Once you've done your uh, access and uh, exploration and you know that you have a patient that is already fairly anesthetized and you don't have any issues with anesthesia now it's time to do your secondary isolation which includes the use of uh, opal dam or something else to completely uh, make it a fluid tight uh, seal around the tooth. Now we're starting this cycle with a size 40 uh, 04 which is the first file on the medium procedural pack and we're using as you can see here with this three this is the rhythm motion of three strokes and then removing the file and wiping it and in between we are irrigating so we've done the 40 right now we're moving down to a size 35 again we're going in each canal the distal canals join but I'm still treating them as two canals uh, so uh, I'm doing the uh, the buccal lingual dimension of of an oval shaped canal here so we've done now the same thing with a size 30 and as you can see again irrigation and now we're moving down to the last file in the medium procedural pack which is a size 25. Now all of these four first files were set up uh, to, to the available length which was the first file that I put into the canal and that file really went down to about 19 millimeters or so. So I have our first file uh, hand file our available length was close to our 
original estimated length, which is why we have these uh, four endo sequence files set at uh, about 19 millimeters. And as you can see, the 25 was getting fairly close to it. Now we're measuring the working length. I'm using the PAL Apex locator. And uh, I have set all four, after doing the measurement, uh, I find out that all four of them are set at um, uh, 20 millimeters. So now we're beginning the next cycle, which is the second cycle here that we're using. And we start here with a size uh, 40 again in each um, um, canal, starting at, with the three strokes, the rhythm motion here uh, on the distal. And then the same thing again in the mesiolingual here. And uh, the mesiobuckle was done. And now we're moving to a size 35, which is one size down. And uh, as you can see, each time I'm taking a look at the stopper, which is set at the full working length, 20 millimeters. And I want to make sure that the stopper on each subsequent file is moving closer to the reference point. Now, I'm not pushing hard here. I'm just basically gently guiding the file only to engagement each time, not to resistance, but only to the point of engagement and then just the weight of the handpiece. So we've moved down from a 40 down to a size 25. And here it looks like by the end of the second cycle, the size 2504 reaches the apex in all four of these canals. So at this point, the 25 has reached the, uh, the, the, the full working length. Some people at this point prefer to move up one size and then see where the 30 goes. I personally prefer to go back to the beginning of the cycle because oftentimes what ends up happening is if you go up one size, the 30 may reach the, uh, you know, the, the length as well, as well, and then you would finish at a 30. But if you start from the beginning of the cycle, maybe the next file that reaches the apex is actually a larger file and it allows you to uh, have a larger preparation. So here we go back to a size uh, 40 and as you can see uh, right here with coming back from a size 25, 40 reaches the apex in all four canals. So that's really interesting that we went from a size 25 all the way to a 40 and that is really the way this idea of cycles allows you to gauge the canals. So now it's time for the irrigation and disinfection process after ultrasonics. Now we're using the endovac here, some negative pressure, and I'm not showing you that we run a large volume of irrigant here through the tooth um, to fully disinfect it because the idea here is to create a space that you then disinfect fully at the end before you obturate. So We've gone through the full disinfection process now. I'm ready for the obturation. I'm using the BC sealer here, the biceramic uh, 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 sealer. And I'm using the advanced technique. As you can see, I'm injecting directly in each canal. Uh, again, I have said this uh, many times before. If you don't have a microscope, you should not inject directly into the tooth. What you should do is you should put uh, the BC sealer in a paper pad outside and then um, um, put it in the tooth. Once I have injected only in the upper one half of the tooth, here and uh, I'm now using uh, a file one of the rotary files to push the sealer down to the full working length this is the safest way of uh, placing the sealer close to the apex now I'm taking the ma matching size got a percha points here 40 40s uh, but on the mesial buckle I needed to put a 30 because the 40 was actually pretty tight and that's fine you could use one size smaller cone to fit it because again the sealer is what's uh, causing the uh, um, is creating the seal now they got a percha I've seared off all four at the orifice level condensed them down and now I'm using the ultrasonic and water to remove the sealer that is loose in the canal. And you can see very quickly, it cleans up, the chamber is clean, do a little bit more condensation. I end up with a uh, nice gutta percha right all over the orifice. And here it is, put the cotton and cavity in, in the tooth. And here's the final fill. You can see very quickly, rapidly, and very efficiently, we managed to prepare these uh, four canals, the, the two distals kind of join here uh, to the full working length. And we have fairly large apical preparations, which is very good. But the coronal area, as you can see, is fairly conservative. So that's an important uh, concept to keep in mind that uh, the goal here is to use the cycles uh, back and forth from larger to small in a crown down fashion using this endo sequence technique so that you can get the, um, uh, to get the largest apical preparation possible as long as it's safe. Now, the question that oftentimes comes up here is what is the difference 
between the endo sequence uh, system and the ESX system? So that's a very good question. I should to clarify this. As you can see, a lot of the content that I provided in, the, in recent times has been about ESX, uh, but I still do use the endo sequence also routinely in my office. And it's important to kind of uh, be clear as to what is the indication for each. So let's put it this way. Uh, Obviously, the most important thing to consider here is what is the practice composition that you have. If you end up doing mostly anteriors and some premolars in your practice, then for the most part, you're using the basic technique, and I think the ESX would pretty much be adequate to address those needs. Uh, when you start doing a lot of molars, now then you end up having to hybridize on the advanced technique using the ESX advanced technique or the endo sequence because what ends up happening with when you're using when you have more difficult cases is you do need to have a couple more files and that's what happens with the ESX is that you, you have to add the scout files to the ESX so that you can uh, gradually increase a much tighter canal to an adequately large enough size so that you could then finish it with the finishing file. The endo sequence on the other hand has the system baked into it the additional file so that each procedural pack is actually four with the expediter you got five files which ends up being the same as the ESX advanced which is about four to five files so that's really the key difference so is there a major difference between the two I think it has to do again with your practice composition but if you do use the next level of advanced which is what I call the advanced square uh, or the one we're you know mostly endodontists end up using so it's mostly calcified molars you know first and second molars then in those situations I find that the endo sequence will be able to give you more versatility because you do need to have more files now I have a whole uh, advanced square protocol that I will also share with you in the future because um, I think that uh, in, in, you know, in the more difficult cases, and the cases that I end up seeing also a lot as an endodontist in my practice, um, they're cases that you just can't do with two files. They're cases you need to have more files on. You need to, to, to share the cutting action in order to increase a very tight and curved canal to an adequate size, uh, you need to, to, to um, use more files, basically. I mean, there's no way around it. I know we all want to use less files, and I know many manufacturers and uh, so on uh, talk about using single files, but almost everybody who does use um, who does do difficult cases can tell you that beyond the marketing and so on, uh, you do need to have more files to do root canal therapy and more difficult cases in a predictable fashion as well as a safe fashion because that really is the, the crux of the issue. How can we do things not only predictably but also safely? And when it comes to that, in the advanced squared or super difficult cases, you need to have more files. So. We're, that area is going to be covered um, in the future. There's no uh, question about it. I'm, I'm, you know, I will spend more time talking about these things, and I, we have many uh, courses in the um, uh, plans for you guys to to uh, talk about various uh, aspects of the system, ESX and endo sequence, and how you could best implement both of them in order to get the most predictability and safety out of your cases. So if you like our content, just don't forget to uh, become a member of our website. Uh, membership is free. Uh, join us also on Facebook, like and share this content. It's, you know, it takes a lot, a lot of time to make this uh, stuff and I really appreciate it when you guys uh, share it with your uh, friends. All questions uh, regarding this content and other is only answered on our website in the forum area. It's just impossible for us to answer questions in any of the other social media because there's so many of them. Having said that, we have a lot of things in, in plan for you guys coming up in the coming year. So don't forget to join us on Rebuildendo.com. And uh, I'm going to leave you guys with some footage uh, from Germany that I captured. And in the meantime, I'm Ali Nesse, and I hope you found this information helpful. Since
we have learned from mistakes lost in the past.